Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to the NCAI breakout session, Retiring Indian School Mascots, Informing, Tracking, and Fueling a Growing National Movement. My name is Dr. Ian Record. I serve as Vice President of Tribal Governance and Special Projects at the National Congress of American Indians, and I will be serving as session moderator. Before we begin, a few notes about how this session will work. To ensure optimal quality control, this session has been pre-recorded. However, all of our panelists are present today. If you have a question at any time for one or all of the panelists, please enter your question in the chat box and they will happily answer it for you. If you have a question for all of the panelists, preface your question with question for all in all caps. If you have a question for a single panelist, preface your question with question four and then that person's first name in all caps. If you have a question for NCAI, preface your question with question for NCAI in all caps. There's a chance that we will not be able to answer all of the questions you post during our time together, but that's okay. After the session, we will have the panelists respond to any unanswered questions in writing and then share their answers with you via, via a follow-up email that will also contain important uh, related resources on the subject of our session today. This session will provide an overview of the growing movement among K-12 schools across the country to retire offensive and harmful native theme mascots, its connection to recent developments among professional sports teams, and how NCAI has been working to inform and guide this movement. We have an extraordinary panel with us today who will share about how these efforts have taken shape at the local, state, and national levels, the particular challenges of educating school communities about the impacts school mascots have on both native and non-native people, and effective strategies for constructive dialogue focused on why these mascots should be retired and how. But before we hear from them, we wanted to briefly, briefly provide you with an overview of the state of play on this issue at K-12 schools across the country. As some of you know, the National Congress of American Indians has been working tirelessly to advance Indian country's efforts to remove these mascots from sports and popular culture for more than 50 years, launching a formal initiative way back in 1968. It has since passed several resolutions setting forth tribal nations position and priorities on the subject. Indian country has made significant progress over the past five decades. Since 1970, roughly two thirds of all native themed mascots have been retired at the K-12 collegiate and professional sports levels. Among the more notable developments, in 1972, Stanford University retires its Indians mascot. In 1994, St. John's University retires its Red Men mascot. Just three years later, Miami University retires its R-word mascot. Two years ago, the Cleveland Indians announced that they are phasing out their Chief Wahoo mascot. Last year, Little League International bans racially insensitive mascots through a national directive to all of the teams that it sanctions. And then as many of you know, earlier this year, the Washington N NFL team finally relented bringing an end to its R word racial slur mascot. To help grow this movement, particularly at the K-12 school level, last year, NCAI began work on its national school mascot tracking database, which it unveiled in May, 2020. The database enables NCAI staff to identify, track, engage, and educate schools that are having active conversations about whether and how to change their mascots, educating them about the many documented harms that such mascots cause native people, in particular native youth, and NCAI's longstanding formal opposition as a national governing body of tribal nations to the continued use of these mascots. NCAI updates the database daily through real-time Google alert notifications and direct ongoing engagement with many of the schools featured in the database. The database features comprehensive information for each school, from online news stories to school mascot logos, 
to detailed contact information for school principals, superintendents, and school board members. As of October 30th, 2020, these are the numbers. A total of 1,922 schools from just over 1,000 school districts across the country still retain some form of native theme mascot, whether it be the R word, Indians, Braves, Chiefs, Warriors, Red Men, Red Raiders, and the list goes on. These numbers have been dropping steadily over the past several months due to a few key factors. Indian country's unrelenting edu education and advocacy on the subject, the murder of George Floyd and its galvanizing effect on the racial justice movement across this nation, and the growing number of school students, parents, teachers, administrators, school board members, and alumni who have taken a stand to stand on the right side of history. Since the murder of George Floyd in late May 2020, NCAI has used the database to individually engage more than 150 schools. 29 of those schools have since decided to retire those mask, their native theme mascots, and another 28 schools um, that we have tracked have done the same, bringing the total to a uh, for this year, a total number of school changes to 57, and there are several more schools that, are, uh, that do have mascot votes pending here in the next couple of months. Among the 57 schools that have decided to retire their mascots in 2020 is Loveland High School in Colorado, which voted to do away with its Indians mascot on September 2nd of this year. These quotes shared by a school board member and a native alum of the school are telling. Pam Howard, member of the Thompson School District Board of Education stated, one of the simplest ways to assess this is just to ask, would we select an Indian or Indians for a new Thompson School District mascot in 2020? I think we all know what the answer is. Of course, we would not select an Indian. That time has passed. We do know better. And Adam Woods McCormick, a high school alum and a Native American stated, while I don't expect any effect and I am proud to have graduated from LHS, my heritage shouldn't be a mascot. As the earlier figures indicate, despite the tremendous progress that has been made, much work remains. Here are the current tallies of four of the most common Native theme mascots and images from some of the schools in question. So when you think about the R word, we still have across the country 97 K-12 public schools in the country with that mascot. You think about the mascot, the Indians, we have currently 800 total schools across the country. Braves, 208 schools, and Chiefs, 181 schools. With that overview of the current landscape as context, now we would like to turn to our panel. With us today are Molly and Dana, ambassador of the Penobscot Nation, who led a successful effort to get the state of Maine's legislature to pass a law banning the use of Native American mascots in public schools and colleges in the state. Suzanne Schoen Harjo, president of the Morningstar Institute and former executive director of NCAI, who has fought for decades for the removal of native theme mascots of the professional collegiate and K-12 levels. Dr. Aaron Payment, first vice president of NCAI and chairman of the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians, who is an authority on the subject and has testified at several local school board meetings. Dr. Leslie Rasmussen, member of the Forest Hills School District Board of Education in Cincinnati, where she was a vocal voice on the board, advocating for the retirement of Anderson High School's R word mascot, which finally occurred in June, 2020 and Randy L. Teton, public affairs manager for the Shoshone Bannock tribes, who along with tribal leaders has spearheaded her tribe's efforts to engage local schools in Idaho, which has led to the recent retirement of several native theme mascots. During our opening panel discussion, each panelist will have eight minutes to share their thoughts in response to a unique question that I pose. Suzanne, let's start with you. Over the past several decades, you have been at the forefront of Indian country's fight to remove these mascots from sports and popular culture. How do you put the developments of the past months into the context of this long struggle? 
And how has the focus on the professional sports teams like the Washington football team been meant to create a domino effect at the collegiate and K-12 school levels? Thank you, Ian, and thanks to everyone at NCAI who's put this together. It's an important topic, and a lot of people don't realize that it's uh, foundational and atmospheric and contextual, but everyone, including policymakers, including filmmakers, everyone gets their information through popular culture. And the more accurate we, we have as as um, our depictions in popular culture, including the sports world, advertising world, the things we drive around in, all of those things. If, if we don't have accurate representation of us there, we're not going to have good public policy made for us because policymakers don't make good public policy for cartoons and mascots and people who allow themselves to be called bad names. This is a mighty effort, and I'm very proud to have been part of it since I was a senior in high school and was recruited into the No Mascot movement by Clyde Warrior, who was a great orator, fine dancer, and he was recruiting people for the new National Indian Youth Council based on his Oklahoma Indian Youth Council. And he spoke at our school in Oklahoma City and was um, very interested in all the Native people there trying to get us to be his soldiers against Little Red, the mascot at the University of Oklahoma. Well, we all didn't like Little Red. He was always a white guy who looked kind of dumb and danced uh, some dance that had nothing to do with Native peoples. And he was, um, uh, this was Clyde Warrior's main focus to get rid of Little Red. Yes, there were voting rights. Yes, there were student rights. Yes, there were boarding schools that still needed to be closed. But his main thing was, let's get rid of these depictions. And the worst one, he said, is the one right there in the nation's capital with that ridiculous name, and we shouldn't even say it. Um, and he was talking about the R word and the Washington NFL franchise. So those two things became my kind of mission. And at the same time, NIYC and Clyde Warrior and others were, were coordinating with Native students at Stanford, at Dartmouth, at Syracuse, at Marquette, all over the United States and trying to change all of these at once. Little Red became the very first one in American sports to fall, and that was in 1970. And by our count, which I guess was, was not uh, totally accurate, was about 3,000 of these. Since 1970, we have eliminated two, over 2,000. And uh, so we're, we're still, even with the NCAI count today on the downhill slide, but we can't relax. What we decided to do in this, in one part of the movement, myself and another person who had served as NCAI executive director, Vine Deloria Jr., the, our most prominent author and theologian and historian and activist attorney, uh, just about everything. Uh, he was. He and I were two of the plaintiffs that um, that sued the Washington team because they wouldn't meet with us. They wouldn't change their name. They wouldn't entertain it. Um, no one had met with any Native people from the team, uh, or any team owners had met since 1972. So in 1992, we sued, and. Uh, we had a case that they called frivolous, but it lasted 17 years, uh, which means it wasn't frivolous. And we did not lose on the merits. We lost on a technicality called latches. And when I saw that the uh, courts were going to take the easy way out in all likelihood, uh, in, 19, uh, in 2005, I organized the 
a second lawsuit uh, of Native young people with, um, who, who wouldn't have the latches problem, the technical problem that had been identified by the trial judge in our case. And so we, uh, I recruited and, and interviewed and talked with long, long talks uh, with people who were 18 to 24. And we finally had our group and our lawyers um, agreed to represent them. And that became the Black Horse case that was then held in abeyance pending the outcome of our case. So we had both cases uh, moving and not moving at the same time. Um, our case from 2009 to, uh, from 1992 to 2009, and the Black Horse case from active from 2010 to 2017, and then a third set of cases um, that uh, were called Harjo et al. protest, letters of protest to try to block requests that had stacked up for these um, for the same terrible names. Our, our idea all along from the 60s on was to try to get the Washington team to change its name in the same way that we moved on repatriation laws and won by by a, the same kind of king of the mountain strategy with the Smithsonian Institution and then partnered with them to create our glorious National Museum of the American Indian. Uh, we were able to, to gain lots of changes in schools and uh, throughout the country every time we would be in the press on, on our litigation. And that was very important. People would call and say, we've been working for three generations in my family to get rid of this. And all of a sudden, because there was some hoopla about your case, the school decided to do it. And I would like to point out that in all the over 2,000 changes we've made collectively, only two have involved litigation of any kind. And um, I think that's amazing. And why? Because in educational sports, it's different from professional sports, which is all about the money, solely about the money. Money talks forever and doesn't talk to anyone that doesn't have it ever. In educational sports, it's about the health and well-being of the people. And even though there's big money involved in uh, the great teams and the lesser teams, there still is a premium placed on people's education and cross-cultural understandings and trying not to create problems where none should exist. So I, I really applaud all the people who are working in education and who take this issue to heart because it's certainly hurting our children, while with non-Native people, it seems not to hurt them. And I can't tell you how, how awful that makes some of us feel to know that what is very painful to my grandchildren makes other people who are not Native feel great. Now that's sort of what we're up against in a societal sense. And we need to come to grips with that in this, at this time when the whole world is geared up for racial and social justice reckoning. This is part of our reckoning. It's no wonder that this happened so quickly with the Washington franchise after George Floyd and after Breonna Taylor that it is no wonder, it is no accident. And I should point out that it only took the reckoning and a pandemic and a, an economic crisis and a climate crisis to get it done for someone to finally say, 
actually it was the three people who owned the minority 40% of the franchise to say, we're not going to do this anymore. Now, part of it was because their women employees were being sexually harassed in the front office, but part of it was the bullying and the general racism along with the sexism that they began to see in their own operation. So this is um, quite the thing, and we're very excited about changes. I expect to see hundreds of schools change, and keep in mind that, that when we started, there were lots and lots of teams called the R word. There, there's no educational, higher learning, learning education institution now with that team name. And that's progress. And we're, we're moving in on them. What we found was that the Washington franchise was paying for a lot of the teams with that name, uh, outfitting them, paying extra money to, um, um, for whatever they needed uh, in those schools. One of those schools was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, Union High School. And now I assume that money is going to dry up a bit and those schools will have zero reason to keep calling themselves something that even their former benefactors have stopped using. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suzanne, um, for, for sharing, sharing about this issue and for, for everything that you have done for, for Indian country on this issue and, and so many others. Um, next, I wanted to turn it over to uh, Mollian. Uh, you have been fighting this fight at the state level. Uh, how did the legislative effort to ban uh, race-based school mascots in the state of Maine take shape? And how did you and Penobscot Nation work to get that legislation across the finish line? How, and, and how can and should the Maine law serve as a model for other states? Thank you so much, NCAI, uh, everyone on the panel for talking about this really important uh, topic, something that's so close to my heart. Uh, here in Maine, we've been working on this journey for a really long time. And it's something that started for me when I was a teenager. Probably for a lot of us Indigenous people, we have kind of our story about when we first got sparked to work on these mascots. And for me, I was 15 or 16 years old, and I saw a, a high school basketball game going on between two teams. One was the Warriors, and one was the Indians. And both teams, the cheerleaders, the fans, the players, everybody was all decked out in their fake feathers, fake war paint. And at the time, you know, being a Penobscot woman, young woman, you know, it was so central to my identity, these very sacred parts of our culture, and it really kind of grounded me in the world. So to see them so mocked and disrespected, it made me really angry. And over the years, that anger kind of turned into motivation to, to start activism around these, first as a peer uh, when I was a youth, and then on up through my career. So my role as ambassador for the nation actually exists because the relationship between the state of Maine and the Penobscot nation had turned so sour over the years that we pulled our legislative representative. So we created this role of ambassador and I was able to be the first person to be in this role. And one of my first goals was to really zero in on what can we do about these Indian mascots. We had been successful over the past 20 plus years in going to each school individually in all of our local cities and towns, and all of them had changed except for one. And it was actually the one that I saw when I was a teenager. It was um, Skowhegan Indians. So we were working kind of side by side this effort to change the last mascot in Skowhegan and to get this bill passed. And I had a standing relationship with a state representative. We had worked on campaigns together. So him and I wrote two bills. Uh, we changed Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day, and we wrote the bill banning these mascots. And luckily, thankfully, we did a lot of good work with the lawmakers and the governor's office, and we got both of these uh, bills passed into law. 
Now the state of Maine, it looks really great on the surface that we got those two bills through, but we have really deep rooted problems around the state recognizing and respecting tribal sovereignty. So we've taken another step in, in that work over the past year since these bills have been made into law. And I can say that while those two bills may seem symbolic to some people, they've really set the table in a nice way to talk about the larger discussions around sovereignty and clean water rights and jurisdictions. And uh, we were able to extend VAWA to the tribes in Maine, which was a huge uh, victory. So I see that the mascot bill as being so important and the Indigenous Peoples Day bill because it really sparked so many discussions around race and equity and you know how can we interact as equals and see each other as sovereigns if you don't see us as people. Right. So from, you know, my angry teenage days <laughs> on up through all this activism, school by school, to being able to take this to the state house, it's been a long arc. And I really, I get so motivated hearing other stories of people in other states. I have good friends in Vermont and Colorado and all these places that are now approaching these discussions with local schools. And now that Maine has made a law statewide, um, we have, you know, set this great precedent of we can do this at a state level. Now, thankfully, you know, we had the right political climate in Maine. We had a Democratic governor, Democratic Senate, Democratic House of Representatives. And I think it's disappointing that this is a partisan issue sometimes because I see it as a human rights issue. But for us, that's how the stars aligned. And those were kind of our allies on this were the Democrats. So to places that, that don't kind of have the friendly political environment right now, I say, you know, keep working. I think the biggest part of this issue is to appeal to people's kind of shared humanity. And I think that we have the facts on our side. You know, it's documented now that it's a fact that these mascots are harmful and racist and aren't just kind of surface problems, but they do affect attitudes and behavior and policy. We are oppressed in real ways because of these mascots, you know, these cycles of poverty and addiction and, and trauma in our communities is, you know, directly linked to these stereotypical images and how harmful they are. So I feel like by making this law, we have the, the facts on our side. Now we have some policy on our side. And now there's all this space for personal stories to be told. And I think that the more we tell those stories, uh, we are certainly benefiting from the racial awakening as Suzanne Harjo, uh, who's a huge hero of mine, it's so great to share space with her, um, spoke about, we are absolutely making our voice heard in that and doing it in such a great way. I, I've been so inspired by the way that indigenous people have kind of chimed in without shifting the focus but adding to the overall picture of racial equity in America. We are in our ancestral homelands. We are still here. We are sovereign entities. And we are, you know, saying we, we matter. It's very, very simple. And these mascots and, and the Land of Lakes lady and Aunt Jemima and Uncle Ben, you know, we're thinking about how our society has been permeated by this constant imagery that doesn't relate to who we are as a real existing living people. So I think that, you know, thinking about the state of Maine, we still have a long, long way to go, but I'm so encouraged by the work we did around this mascot bill and the other, uh, the Indigenous Peoples Day bill. And I think that with the Washington football team changing, and we have kind of a special link to Cleveland, because supposedly um, the Cleveland Indians were named after a Penobscot man, Louis Duck Alexis, who played there. And it's true that when he joined the team, they were the Spiders and they changed to the Indians. It was kind of, um, you know, there's other accounts that it was kind of a derogatory thing. It was like so new for an Indian to be playing on a team that that just became the nickname, oh, they're the Indians. And he was often kind of, um, you know, mocked and booed when he didn't do well. And he had a very 
tragic story with alcoholism following his baseball career. So it, it's kind of a really sad story, and it twists the knife when we see Chief Wahoo with, with the big red nose and, and the uh, red skin, and, and it's just, um, it, it's not an honor, obviously. So on behalf of Penobscot Nation, we are very glad that they'll be changing that as well. So it's, it's great to be here with all of you. I get really excited about this work and I would love to uh, talk more in, in the follow-up and answer any questions. And I truly hope that more states can follow what we've done in Maine because it's so, so important for indigenous populations that these bills pass. Thank you so much, Molly. And your, your point in particular about you know, appealing to our shared humanity, I think is something that we're seeing play out across, across the nation in so many of these uh, local school conversations about, again, about whether and how to, to retire these sorts of mascots. Um, Chairman Payment, uh, you are both a scholar of this issue on a grand scale, and you've been advocating at the local level to have schools retire these mascots. Uh, can you share a little bit about why you have focused your leadership uh, so intensively on this issue? And can you share some of the dynamics that you have experienced in, in local school debates about their mascots, including that of, of Anderson High School in Cincinnati? Absolutely. Ani Buju Biwak Chigandishan Kas Matwa Magizi and Dorum Bawating and Donjaba Nishnabe Ojibwe Odawa Otawatami and Dao. so uh, my name is Aaron Payman. I'm the chairperson of my tribe. Um, I'm a high school dropout and I have uh, several advanced degrees in education. So I've made it my business to do the research on the academic side. Uh, to match my activism. I've been involved in this uh, fight since the 1980s uh, when I was an undergrad, and so I also want to echo, I'm, I'm very honored to be on a panel with Suzanne Harjo uh, because I cited her over the years and the work that she's done, and it's motivated me, so I'm, I'm very grateful to be part of this uh, panel. Um, so I speak at school boards, I speak to media, wherever anybody wants me to talk about this issue, I'm, I'm more than uh, happy to try to educate other people about uh, this issue. One very simple question for people to ask um, uh, for school leaders is uh, if they're unsure that this, uh, the use of these mascots is racist, is to ask why are we the only race that is subjected uh, to the use of these mascots. Another simple test is to substitute any other race for the name of a team. Uh, you would not allow it for any other race, but somehow uh, we're subjected to it. And so um, why are we the only race that's befitting of this honor? Spoiler alert. It is not an honor to be subjected to this experience. So as an educational leader, I'd like to begin by addressing uh, fellow school leaders on the subject of culturally appropriate climate. Um, school leaders uh, used to follow the Interstate Leadership Licensure Consortium um, and to provide for a culturally appropriate environment for all students to learn. Uh, so now, since 2015, uh, we follow the National Policy Board for Education Administration and outlines professional standards for educational leaders. And I wanna go through these because it'll demonstrate to you uh, the inconsistency with our charge as profession, professionals and uh, what's happening right under our noses. Uh, so under standard one, the national policy describes that effective educational leaders, A, develop an educational mission for the school to promote the academic success and well-being of each student. B, promote a vision for the school on the successful learning and development of each child and on instructional and organizational practices that promote such successes. And C, advocate and cultivate core values that define the school's culture, including child-centered education, equity, inclusiveness, social justice, openness, caring, and trust. Then under standard two, ethics and professional norms, it calls for placing children at the center of education and accept the responsibility for each student's academic success and well-being, that's sub C. Uh, C, uh, D is safeguard and promote the values of equity, social justice, and diversity. And E, lead with an understanding of all students' backgrounds and cultures. Then under standard C, equity and cultural responsiveness, it identifies that effective educational leaders, A, ensure that each student is treated fairly, respectfully, and with an understanding of each student's culture and context. And then B, Recognize, respect, and employ each student's strengths, diversity, and culture as aspects of teaching and learning. E, confront and alter institutional biases of student marginalization and low expectations associated with race, class, culture, and language. And F, promote the preparation of students to live productively and 
contribute to the diverse cultural context. So an important question to ask is how do we know that the use of mascots for American Indian race and only our race is inconsistent with our professional ethical standards educational leaders and school leaders are bound by? In 2005, American Psychological Association called for the immediate retirement of all American Indian mascots, symbols, images, and personalities by schools, colleges, universities, athletic teams, and organizations. This position is based on a growing body of social science literature that shows that the harmful effects of racial stereotyping and inaccurate racial portrayals includes the particularly harmful effects of American Indian sports mascots on the social identity and development and self-esteem of native young people. Um, continued use of these mascots, symbols, images, and personalities has a negative effect on not only American Indian students, but on all students by undermining the educational experiences of members of all communities, especially those who've had little or no contact with indigenous people. Further use of these mascots establishes an unwelcome and oftentimes hostile learning environment for Native students that affirms negative images and stereotypes that are promoted in Main Street society. According to Stephanie Freiberg, University of Arizona, American Indians are, I'm sorry, American Indian mascots are harmful, not only because they're often negative, but because they remind American Indians of the limited ways in which others see them. This in turn restricts the number of ways American Indians can see themselves. Further, American Indian mascots undermine the ability of American Indian nations to portray accurate and respectful images of our culture, spirituality, and traditions, present stereotypical images of American Indians. Such mascots are contemporary example of a prejudice of the dominant culture against racial and ethnic minority groups and is a form of discrimination against American Indian nations. According to the former APA president, Dr. Ronald LaFont, the use of American Indian mascots as symbols in schools and university athletic programs is particularly troubling because schools are places of learning. These mascots are teaching stereotypical, misleading, and too often insulting images of American Indians. These negative lessons are not just affecting American Indian students, they send the wrong message to all students. And so when you ask yourself, if you use such mascots um, based on American Indian race, the use of it was not derogatory, why are American Indians the only race to be subjected to this practice? And so here's a, a picture of our, um, our young people at NCI a couple years ago, and we ask that you rethink, replace, and rename these mascots. Um, and then also a thank you on behalf of our future generations. On your question, um, uh, Dr. Ian, uh, I have uh, attended a school board meetings, and I have to tell you, I'm a very strong, resilient person, uh, but I have experienced uh, the racism that the families experience. Uh, in particular, at one school, I, I sat next to a parent, and they uh, had a freshman in high school, uh, their, their child who's native, and I had to watch the argument being made to people who I would expect would be more learned and knowledgeable um, about this experience. and just watch, I could feel the heaviness on that young person. And then watch one by one people get up and say, well, we're honoring you. What's wrong with you? We're honoring you. And, um, and then watch fake Indian people get up and, and be given the floor to testify on behalf of why this is acceptable for American Indians. The whole experience is just so blatantly racist and derogatory. And it's unfortunate that people who don't experience this um, I understand how, how culturally insensitive they are uh, when they allow this, um, but it is our job to try to educate other people, and I'm committed to doing that. Um, uh, at the uh, school in Cincinnati, I drove down uh, eight hours to get there, and then I testified, then I drove eight hours back, and I can tell you I had to pray, I had to smudge, I had to ask my ancestors for some healing because of the historical and intergenerational trauma that it it provoked in me, but imagine a young person having to put up with that every day. And so with that, you know, we can build the resiliency and, and recommit our efforts and, and help to eradicate uh, this racist practice. My hope is in the future, I'll look back and say that I made a contribution and that um, I can't believe how, how uncivilized and savage people were that we even allowed this to happen that long.
Jamie Glitch. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Payment. Uh, that, that high school in Cincinnati you mentioned uh, is Anderson High School. And going from one doctor to another, I'd like to turn now to Dr. Rasmussen. Uh, you serve on the Forest Hills School District Board, which oversees Anderson High School, a school that broached the question of retiring its R-word mascot multiple times over the years before finally voting to discard it this past summer. How did the school ultimately reach its decision and what reasons did you and your fellow school board members provide in justifying it? Um, thank you for having me. Um, before I start, I want to let Dr. Payment know that with the few people I've shared um, about this panel, the news about this panel with, so every single one of them remember you and wanted me to express our sorrow that you had to sit through that and to thank you for your efforts um, because it's still talked about today, even two years later. So you did make a difference. Um, and I, it's unfortunate that it took two more years. There, there were some pivotal things that happened um, in our school district. Now, two board members decided they were going to step down. So then we had a school board race with two new seats open. Um, it began with five individuals and it trickled down to just three, myself and two others who had teamed up to run together. And the two that ran together were vocal um, proponents of keeping the mascot at Anderson High School. So the suburban school board race became quite contentious and it focused a lot on our positions over the mascot. We do have two high schools in the district, but that was one of the sort of driving points during the school board election. Um, and I won. So <laughs> I won my, I won the seat on the school board and the team that ran together won, only one won, obviously. Um, so quickly the dynamics changed in January. Um, and then, you know, fast forward to April when we saw the murder of George Floyd and these, you know, conversations in our country um, about racial, racial tensions were amplified. Um, inevitably that had to include discussion of Anderson High School and our R word mascot. It just had to. Um, and several of us on the board started to notice social media posts that were popping up in our community pages uh, about people talking about it. Um, we started to have some emails trickling in, um, asking us to, to reconsider. The, if there was ever a time, now is the time. Um, and one of the other board members approached the rest of us individually and said, listen, this is happening, you know, like people are talking about this. We have a cornerstone in our, in our um, strategic plan that is to focus on inclusivity. And frankly, we should probably just remove that if we're not going to actually address this. Um, I had an opportunity to tour Anderson High School soon after I was elected. I had only been in small parts um, and touring the entire thing was just really shocking to me, I think, to see the extensiveness um, of this mascot, this caricature um, of, a, of humans, you know. So I was very passionate and immediately on board uh, with the other board members' efforts. Um, and before we knew it, you know, we had thousands of emails from people and there was constant um, social media dialogue uh, about what Anderson High School is gonna do and what our school board is going to do. Um, and we just couldn't ignore it. There were some very tense conversations between board members, um, uh, as expected. Uh, so initially of our five member board, two of us, no question, we, we were always going to support the change of this and we wanted to see it happen, particularly now. Um, in fact, it was one of the reasons I ran for school board. I saw what happened in 2018 and I was disgusted. Um, and so two of us felt that way. One of us who was elected when I was in November was never going to change her mind. And then the other two were longtime community members and their, their families were raised here in, in, in Anderson. Um, one of them went to the other high school in town and one of them was a graduate of Anderson High School. 
And I gave my speech and Dee Dee Choice, the other board member who, who led the charge with this, also gave her speech. And, you know, we had, I think, compelling arguments. But ultimately, I think those other two board members that were from the community um, perhaps gave the most compelling arguments because it was an evolution for them to arrive at the decision to retire this mascot. It was an evolution of them to understand that this is no longer, right? This is not, it's just not right. And we need to move our district and our students in, in the right direction, essentially. So one of them, for him, it was really more about the fact that this is a divisive issue and it is a distraction in our schools. And he had to realize that, and I don't think he even understood how much of a division it was in the schools, but the principal couldn't go into the gym and say, go whatever mascot, right? Because inevitably some people would take issue with it and others didn't care. They just, they started sending out two different newsletters, one that included the mascot, one that didn't. Um, and as he started to realize how deep of an issue this was, um, a divisive issue, but it's just ultimately a distraction. And we just went through this two years ago. It happened in the nineties. Also, um, we had other older ex board members, um, reach out to us and say, we should have done more. We should have stopped this in the 90s. We should have stopped this in the early 2000s. Now's your chance. You know, do what we were not brave enough to do, essentially, is how they, they pitched it to us. And for him, that was enough. He understood that, that, that this is it. That's time. And one of the things that he shared with me that was the most compelling argument for him were these emails that we were receiving from students, former students, who had left our little bubble and experienced the world and realized, oh my goodness, this is not, this is not okay. You know, the Native Americans are human beings. They are not caricatures for us to, you know, mock and whatnot. Um, and so those were really compelling for him personally. And our other school board member who was an alum of Anderson High School gave this beautiful speech about pride and she pulled out the cover of her yearbook from the year she graduated in 1998 and on it it said pride and she gave you know she delivered this speech about how we had pride in this mascot and she tried to you know i think find some common ground with these folks that wanted to keep it and say like we didn't know but now we do know and we know that this isn't about pride or, or our need to hold on to it is to be prideful. And that is, doesn't change the fact that it is, that we know better now, essentially. Um, and so with a four to one vote, we decided to officially retire that mascot once and for all. Um, we received several types of, of, of email messages, I would say. And, you know, I'm a communication professor, so a lot of what I study is discourse and that sort of thing and, and how you prepare persuasive arguments. Um, and one thing you don't do is be combative, right? You gotta, you gotta convince me using rational discourse, essentially. And the vitriol in the emails that we received from people who desperately wanted to keep the mascot were so over the top. Like, you're a racist, you're a fascist, you're a socialist. I mean, any, anything you can imagine, they said. Um, that doesn't do anything. That's not persuasive. That's not helpful. Um, so we had that type of email. And then we had these really emotional stories from people that just shared their experiences there. Um, and then we had others that just took a pragmatic approach of, well, we can't change this because it's going to cost too much money. To that, my retort was simply, you don't put a dollar on racism. You don't, you know, it, it, we, can't, we can't pick and choose um, what we're going to accept with regard to racism and what we're not going to accept. It is all or nothing, and we're going to be all. Um, and, you know, ultimately, it was probably a two-week process, which seemed a little, I, I mean, I would love it to have been a 24-hour process, 
But given our community, and Dr. Payment knows because he's been here, I was surprised it only took two weeks um, to, to get everybody on board and in a position where we had a four to one vote. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it's, our community is very uh, different. <laughs> I've only been a resident since 2016, so I, you know, it, it was new to me. And when I moved here, I didn't realize the high school's name was what it was. And I was really just thinking immediately when I learned of it, like, well, we got to move before this is, unless they're going to change this. And then slowly it just started to build. And it, it was like, somebody has to do something about this. We're going to do something about this. Um, and, you know, and we did. So I'm so grateful for your support, Dr. Payment, and everyone just seeing your stories and, Ultimately, what I would love to see happen in Ohio is what happened in Maine. So I was so glad to hear you talk about, you know, what you went through and how, how you all did that. Because um, this fight for me personally isn't over. Um, I would like to see us get some legislation in Ohio um, to just stop this once and for all. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Rasmussen. Appreciate your courage on this issue and, and those of your colleagues. And I, I think, you know, Anderson is quickly becoming a model for other schools across the country, not just in terms of how you arrived at the decision, but how you're, you're actually working to implement that decision now, which we can talk a little bit more about in our moderated uh, discussion. I'd like to turn it over to Randy L. Teton now. Uh, Randy, Randy L., in your position as a uh, public affairs manager, you have been working closely with the leadership of the Shoshone Bannock tribes to educate schools and school communities in your area about the harms these mascots cause and the tribe's call to do away with them. Uh, can you provide an overview of what that educational process entails, the resistance you have encountered, and, and how you've worked to overcome it? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, NCAI, for this invite to be a panelist on this very important topic of mascots. And, uh, you know, um, I serve as the public affairs manager for the Shoshone Bannock tribes and working directly with my leadership uh, since 2011, I've been doing this. And um, since then I have uh, experienced both the good and the bad of working uh, with community relationships. And that's um, with our state governor, our local mayors, our county commissioners, our state legislators, uh, our board, um, my tribe is very unique. We are the largest tribe in the state of Idaho. Therefore, we sit in four counties. So it's very important for anyone that works in our tribal government to understand, um, you know, the county government people. Who are they? Um, and for me, um, I'm a one-woman show where it is my job to build the relationship with our local counties, our local governor, um, our local state officials. And so when this mascot issue came about in 20, I'd say 2013, uh, we were approached by a school called the Teton um, High School. And it's funny because my last name is Teton. Um, and, uh, you know, it comes from the beautiful Grand Teton Mountains is where my name came from. So this school called Teton High School was home of the Redskins. Um, and coincidentally, it actually is an area that has personal family ties to my grandfather's side. That was his old camping and hunting grounds for my grandfather's uh, ancestors. So I had not only um, was reached out to, to see what the tribe's uh, perspective was, but also because of my name. Uh, and so when this school reached out to us um, in 2013, um, one thing was, is we feel that this needs to be changed, but we don't really know what the proper cultural protocol or if there was a protocol. Um, so first things first, government to government, we had the uh, superintendent at that time visit our council and have that conversation and the conversation was good, um, but not for him. He went back to the school board and he had a school board meeting. And at that school board meeting, um, he was, uh, he was uh, basically 
um, bullied by his own community members because of his effort of meeting with the Fort Hall Business Council um, and trying to understand um, if it was culturally inappropriate. And uh, he ended up uh, giving it to the school board to task. And the school board at that time reached out to me. We um, began our conversations. And we ended up, we as the tribe, took it to a next level. Uh, we ended up uh, reaching out to our friends at the state uh, Indian education. Uh, our tribe hosts a legislative reception at our capital every year. So I maintain those relationships with the, with the legislators. And I was able to call them up individually that represent our region and talk to them about what we were doing. And I think that really helped versus having our legislators read something in the paper or see something on the news. Um, and that's the other role that I play is I am the media point of contact. So um, I felt that, you know, my role within uh, this, um, um, this process was very essential with just being able to talk to people from, you know, a personal level um, and then have them come and meet with our tribal business council to formulate an action. Um, but Teton was, uh, I would have to say, um, similar to what Dr. Payment was experiencing at that school, we were met with very racial people. Um, alumni from that school were very angry that the tribes were coming over to take their heritage away from them. And I felt like, whose heritage are you trying to be respectful to? We as Indian people are saying that it is not okay to you know, wear, the, wear these fake feathers and, and paint your face up. And, um, you know, it was uh, really appalling. And, you know, I get along with a lot of people. And so, you know, for me, it was natural going into this room not knowing anybody. Um, but a lot of people were wearing these very racial slurred uh, T-shirts. And it made me feel very uncomfortable. Um, to the point where, um, you know, I felt a little unsafe after the meeting because you had these cowboys and Indians type of environment happening where I felt like if I was to go to my car by myself that I would be met at my car with um, some very angry people that we were trying to take their heritage away. Um, so, um, you know, I, but I was very dedicated. I let my tribal council know. We had our chairman attend these meetings, these school board meetings. I sat on a panel where we had NCAI support us in that effort, and um, but we were able to do it. Um, and I would have to say that that was really like our success story. Um, not too long after that, we had another school um, actually in Boise, our, our city capital. Um, they reached out to us and that was probably the easiest school because the school board were already on board with wanting to change their mascot and they were uh, Braves. They were Boise Braves. And we ended up going over there to the school grounds and we got to look at everything on their school grounds to see what was um, um, a racial um, mascot. And they had a lot, um, but they were able to quickly make a, a decision, the school board was, and they changed it, the mascot, to a motto. So they changed it from the Braves to to be brave. And I thought that was amazing that they were able to take that brave name and turn it into a positive motto, to be brave. Um, the other school that we actually just worked with, uh, again, we met with a school board. Um, they actually also um, had a lot of angry people contact them through phones and emails. And we, as the tribe, we stayed out of that portion and kind of just let the school board and the school uh, get with their community uh, alumni and their students. And the students were all gung-ho for wanting to make changes. And that was with the Pocatello Chiefs. Um, and so we do have a 1990 resolution that our leadership uh, actually put out in the 1990s um, asking the school to remove the mascot, but there was no uh, one person that actually kept um, that momentum going. Um, but now we've got this ball rolling. 
Uh, we were able to actually put out a position paper in the local media where we had actual community members understand what the tribe's perspective was on why we were so passionate about changing uh, the local mascots in the state of Idaho. Um, so this is a huge success for the state of Idaho schools. Uh, there's a total of five tribes in the state of Idaho. Um, we actually, um, here in southeastern Idaho, um, we are making the changes as much as we can with these local schools. And it wouldn't be possible without, you know, having the support of the legislators, the school board, the state uh, board, um, you know, that wouldn't have been possible to make this task easy. So, um, so that's, that's our success stories. Thank you so much, Randy L. Yeah, it's really extraordinary, particularly in that part of the country where you you wouldn't think you'd be able to make a lot of headway, and, and you have, and that's um, it's it's really promising developments. I, I tracking those schools. I know that there's ongoing education that needs to be done to make sure that the, the changes actually stick. Um, and you know, um, related to that, um, as we move into our moderated discussion now. Um, I wanted to uh, delve a little bit deeper into some of these some of these issues, and um, I, I wanted to start with uh, Dr. Rasmussen. Um, you shared a lot about how the um, the school and the school board arrived at the decision that you did, and obviously it was a very long and bumpy road. Um, can you talk for just a few minutes about um, what is the process looking like now for how you transition to a new mascot? Um, how do you create that in inclusive environment? Um, where you have a new mascot that everyone in the community can embrace and, and you know, maybe shed some light on some of the, you know, the practical logistics of, of making that change. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, I wish um, this process moved a lot faster. And I know many in our community um, feel the same way, but it has sort of been, you know, one step at a time. And I'm trying personally, personally to focus on the fact that we made this decision. We're not going back. Now I need to work the process uh, appropriately. So what we, we had to do is establish several committees at the high school. Um, a lot of it was, you know, there's students um, involved in it and also some middle school students that will eventually find themselves at this high school so that they can be involved in the process. Um, and one component that I'm not entirely comfortable with, but the board um, ultimately wanted to do this, was to find a way to respectfully retire this mascot. And so they're calling it um, honoring the past. And so they're trying to delicately deal with um, some of the, the people that were opposed to it. I'm not on board with that, if I'm being honest. Um, but what that's going to mean is there will be a ceremony where we, you know, maybe show the history of the mascot. That's what we're thinking now. Um, the high school used to be called the Anderson uh, Comets. So they were the Comets. Um, and then in the 90s, the principal was a graduate of Miami University, which you mentioned earlier, changed their, their mascot. They used to be the R word. Um, and they're now the Red Hawks. Well, he changed it when they changed it, uh, and then it just has been with us ever since. So they're trying to do that right now. And then we have um, a selection process underway, um, and we're getting ready to launch a survey with the community to get their input for what they would like to see as part of um, the next mascot. Um, and from here on out, we're really trying to ramp up the community involvement and connection to help everyone kind of rally and get behind it. Um, my board president, who was one of the board members that's you know born and raised in this community, has assured me that once we have that that mascot in place, you know people are going to get behind it. It's it, we're going to forget about this and just move forward. Um, and you know he seems. He seems pretty um, positive that that's what's going to happen. So we're, you know, we did this in the summer. The pandemic obviously um, slowed us down, slowed our progress down. So our goal is to have the um, 
mascot selected, the new mascot selected by January. So the start of the next semester, um, and then we'll ratchet that up. Now it's still been, I'm, you know, if I'm being completely honest here, it's still been contentious. It still has. Um, and I have been vocal about that at school board meetings as well. So for example, Twitter handles um, that are the AHS R word, you know, or R word athletics or R word soccer and things like that, or putting up go skin signs because there's a football game and things like that. No. Um, so I have been very vocal uh, at our school board meetings and one on one with our principals about those are we don't need a process to fix those things. Mm -hmm. you see Anderson soccer, AHS soccer. Right. Um, and I've had to publicly put on some pressure to say these are these are choices that you're making. If we are deeming this, we're, we're not deeming it. We're, we're taking the word of Native Americans that say this is a racial slur. And we know, we know the damage that that does to people. Mm -hmm. um, then you need to make the choice to use a different sign at your pep rally or a different Twitter handle. Um, and I've been met with some resistance, but mostly um, it's been favorable and we have seen some changes, uh, which, which I appreciate. I'm trying to take, I think one important thing to remember as we go through these transition process uh, from school to school is that it's not all going to happen overnight as as desperately as I wish it would um, and and to take sort of those small wins for what they are and as soon as we get this thing done like we're moving forward there's no there's no turning back um, right. and, uh, yeah so that's kind of where we're at right now the pandemic really slowed everything down um, for us unfortunately um, well, you're still plugging along though, which is really important. I think what we, we heard from your answer just now, and it was alluded to by uh, Suzanne and, and Aaron and, and others, is that this is an ongoing process of education and it, it's taken decades in some places for, for the, the, the major sea change to occur, but that, that doesn't mean the education process stops. It's got to continue on. Um, in the remaining time we have, I was wondering if, if our other four panelists could, could share uh, for a few minutes each about, you know, it, it, where do you feel like the, the emphasis needs to be placed on education uh, of school board members, of school administrators? Um, what arguments, you know, if, if, you, if you had a room, room full of, of Dr. Rasmussen's um, in the audience um, that you could speak directly to, what would your main message be? And what, you know, what messages would you want other tribal leaders to carry to them as they engage them at the local level? Um, I think, Dr. Pamey, we can start with you. Sure. Um, so for me, um, I cannot, as an educational leader, I cannot reconcile the continued use of any derogatory uh, racial imagery in a public school system. Um, and so when I went back to school, I, I picked up uh, a higher ed degree, uh, a K-12 degree, that's my ed specialist, and then my doctorate degree. But the ed specialist degree in particular trains educational leaders in our ethical duty and responsibility. And each uh, teacher, each uh, administrator, and by extension, those school board members have a duty to provide a safe and culturally appropriate environment for all children to learn. And so I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to do this, but um, I finished my doctorate a couple years ago now. And I, there is a need for some postdoc work that I, I'm going to have to reluctantly do. Um, because I think the, the change, the next level of change, is gonna to be to challenge those educational leaders. How can you possibly go to work and, and feel ethical and, and responsible when you see this happening right under your nose? Um, so as a profession, as educational leaders, we have that duty. And if you're silent on it, then you're derelict in your duty. And so uh, it's time for all educational leaders to take on that responsibility. And so I might be participating in some research. I, like I said, I don't wanna read anymore. I read all, enough for all that time. Uh, but that's what needs to happen is for educational leaders to accept the responsibility. And, um, and so it's time for us to do it. Thank you, Dr. Payment. Uh, Suzanne, floor is yours. I would implore all educators to be mindful of the mental illness that exists among people who have played with these toys of racism for a long time 
who absolutely will not concede that they are racist or bigoted and refuse to give them up to such an extent that they create even more emotional violence and assaultive behaviors against Native peoples. It takes very little to go from an attitude to an action. And what we've found is that the physicality of our people um, is in danger. And no matter who the, the entity is, uh, with, with the Washington football franchise, they of course had paid thugs and paid fans and the Kansas City Chiefs has paid fans. And I don't know about the thuggery, but um, uh, in our case, you know, there were numerous, numerous death threats uh, that I still get. Uh, so over a quarter century of death threats regarding and myself and Amanda Blackhorse and others from, that, from just those two cases um, uh, against one franchise. In, it is so that once it's changed, people move on. It, whether they like it or not, um, it, it, they, they might make fun of it, they might embrace it, but they do move on. And most of the people will say, oh yeah, what were we thinking? Or, you know, I never really noticed that and I don't know why I never noticed it. So decent people will, will understand more about themselves and about the situation as time goes by. But we're dealing with mental disease amongst many of the people who believe that they are superior to native peoples and that they are have the right to appropriate everything that belongs to us including our names our iconography our symbols and that they have the right to call us names now that's the mindset of a of a playground bully and that's how you have to deal with the person although sometimes you may have to involve the police. So I urge people to deal with this as you would a, a stalking situation because it's that serious. Thank you, Suzanne. Uh, I'd like to turn the floor over to Randy L. Now, you know, just reframing the question here, you know, uh, you've done this at the local level. Um, you know, I guess, what is your advice to other tribal leaders about how to, how to deal with these dynamics, what, what messages that you found have really resonated to, to really drive the point home and get, get more schools across the finish line like you've succeeded in doing in Idaho and, and, and obviously we've seen in, in Cincinnati and Maine and elsewhere. The, me the message that we have been um, talking with the state board level is to reach out to your local tribe. So what might work for southern Idaho might not work for northern Idaho because they're home of the Nez Perce and the Coeur d'Alene. They're a little bit different than us. They're the plateau people. We're the Great Basin. But encouraging the local officials, the state, uh, the state board to meet with the tribes. Uh, for the state of Idaho, we're very fortunate to have one tribal person work with the state uh, uh, education board and she has been a huge advocate in pulling together all of the tribes the five tribes of Idaho and having this working committee that if things like this pop up she is able to say hey what do you guys think could we get a letter of support from each of your tribes you'll have all you'll and then that makes your voice more stronger uh, to work with the local school districts. Um, the local school districts felt like, wow, uh, I'm not only advocating for the Shoshones, but we're advocating for all the tribes in the state. And I think that's important. Also, letting them know to have tribal history curriculum added into the local schools. Here in the state of Idaho, fourth grade, they talk about Native American history. 
And it's interesting because it's only that one grade that they actually dedicate one week to talk about Native American history. And we're trying to change that because that's not enough. Tribal history needs to be part of the entire curriculum for every grade. Um, and we now have uh, a Native American Heritage Month for November. So we bring that up with the local schools is that this is your month to be able to work with a local tribe to find out what it is, uh, you know, bringing them in to talk at a school assembly, um, maybe having some coloring sheets to talk about, you know, what kind of village or teepees or what did they live in. Um, just better understanding the local history of that tribe. Um, but that's been our message is, is we're here to help you uh, be better educators for our kids because our kids just don't go to a tribal school. They attend the local um, public schools. Um, I actually sat on the Indian Education Board for four years where I advocated where the JOM funds are going. How is it being used for tutoring? You know, all of this plays a huge role. Have your local parents run for those, um, it, volunteer for that. Um, it's really just being engaged with what is available to our Indian kids um, and how can I as a parent be an advocate for our youth. Um, so that's our message. Thank you, Randy Ellen. You're absolutely right. You know, the vast majority of Native students uh, go to public schools, um, and so they're 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 immersed in these learning environments, uh, many of which are, are unwelcoming in large part because of these mascots. Um, Molly, and, uh, you have the final word for with us today. So, uh, why don't you share for just a few minutes before we wrap up? Everyone said such great things, and I'm sitting here like jotting things down. Uh, I, I do get really excited about this work, so it's so great to hear kind of uh, and take different things from everybody. I think the point about where does this all come from? Um, Indian mascotry at its core is white supremacy, right? And that can be a very hard thing to talk about. So, you know, there's this great quote some people are so comfortable in their privilege that equality feels like oppression. So that can be a hard barrier to get over because people are so used to the, the, the power dynamics and where they're at and, and they're been, they've been able to take on our identity and use it. I had an instance where one non-native gentleman put his finger in my face and said, I'm just as Indian as you are and this school is my tribe. Uh, so it's very much about identity and, and human psychology. So it, it really brings in so many different issues. What's worked here in Maine, we had a lot of communities say that this didn't need to be a statewide law and that it should be a local control issue. So we really had to craft some strategy around talking about these mascots harm all children, um, native and non-native, and changing them benefits all children. It makes the educational environment so much better. These kids can go actually cheer for a mascot without worrying about the tension or the, or the uh, controversy or harming people. And I saw a lot of students kind of um, let go of these mascots a lot quicker than their parents or grandparents mm -hmm. because you know they're just like, it, it's okay. Like we'll get over it. We'll be proud of the coyotes instead of being the Indians and, and that's all right. So I, I think that's really worked for us here. And, and I love what Randy L was saying about the curriculum. We do have a law uh, on the books here in Maine that mandates um, Native studies in our schools. And we've been able to put some more teeth into that. It's a mandate. Um, it's not a mandate. So there's no fiscal note. But so we've been able to, um, you know, get that supported in different ways. And really, I'll go back to my previous point. When you see people as human beings, it's very hard to mistreat them. Uh, it's very hard to hate up close, is what we've recognized here. And just by virtue of colonization and the settling of America, there are five tribal communities in Maine right now. There used to be upwards of 20 tribes. So when you talk about, look at what we have lost, we're still here, able to ask you to do better and to treat us with respect and equity, uh, that's that's a big conversation to have, but I think we're seeing a shift in the country towards those hard conversations, and I'm really a big one for public policy and for getting natives and allies to run for office, getting people and the school board, getting people in the legislature, getting people on local town boards. I think the time has come 
to be at these tables to have our voices heard and to really be leading this discussion, not just kind of, you know, pulled in for testimony, like, like, let's be the people making these decisions. So I'm so encouraged by Sharice Davis and Deb Holland and the House of Representatives and, and that we're actually seeing representation in these high levels because uh, that's where the changes are going to be made. More importantly are the local levels where we're all working as well because all of that flows up. Uh, all these school boards and schools that we're all working in, that all adds up to so much. That's why Washington changed their name. Ultimately, it was money, <laughs> you know, money talks, and it was this new conversation. But so much of the groundwork that people like Suzanne have been doing for decades, uh, that's all led up to this point. So we're in this fun mix right now of momentum, awakening, action, and having our voices heard. And we really stand on the shoulders of so many before us who didn't have these opportunities. So events like this today, I'm always so happy to be a part of, and, and I hope that we can all stay connected as we move about our work. Thank you all. Thank you, Molly, and so much, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, unfortunately, we, we are out of time, and uh, I really am, am immensely grateful for um, everything that you've shared. Uh, on behalf of NSA, I wanted to thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedule, and, and just wanted you to know that NCI is there in support of your work on this critically important issue um, moving forward. There's so much education that remains to be done um, and we're gonna do our part to make sure that, um, you know, we're, we're sharing Indian Country's unified voice uh, as codified in the NCI resolutions and that we're also bringing, starting to bring more data to the argument. Um, before we close, I did wanna share some related resources uh, from, from NCAI. And, uh, and first, I wanted to turn over the floor to my colleague, Sierra Watt, who is a research associate with NCAI's uh, Policy Research Center. Sierra will be sharing a brief overview of a literature review she conducted on the health impacts of native theme mascots on native people, in particular, native youth. Sierra? Hello, my name is Sierra Watt, and I'm a research associate at the Policy Research Center at the National Congress of American Indians. Today, I'll be providing a brief overview of a literature review that myself, Dr. Rivette Rubido, and Dr. Ian Record conducted on the impacts from Native American mascots. Our review is entitled, 20 Years of Research into the Health Impacts of Native American Mascots, a Scoping Review. The debate around Native-themed mascots has largely centered on public opinion polling and questions of trademark legality, rather than any research into the impacts. However, medical and professional organizations have generally condemned these mascots and their possible negative impacts. We felt that there was a need to review existing research on any potential health impacts stemming from these mascots. We posed two research questions. What research has been done on the health impacts of Native American themed mascots? And what are the impacts on American Indians and Alaska Natives, in particular Native youth, from these mascots, as well as any impacts on the broader public? In terms of methods, we ultimately included 26 articles within our review after screening thousands for possible inclusion. Within those 26 articles, 40 individual tests or studies were conducted. We divided up those 40 tests into three specific groups. Those that focused on native youth, those that focused on American Indian and Alaska native adults, and those that focused on all other racial or ethnic groups. For native youth, only one article in the past 20 years has looked at the impacts from Native American mascots. The authors found that even those mascots considered positive representations still resulted in lower reported self-esteem and lower evaluation of their community's ability to succeed among Native high school students. For articles that looked at American Indian and Alaska Native adults, five tests had been conducted. Respondents noted that Native themed mascots hampered their ability to learn and grow in an educational setting, lowered their belief in their ability to achieve future success, activated dehumanizing stereotypes, 
and uh, resulted in draining physical and mental health impacts from mascot opposition, including physical and verbal aggression, such as spitting and profanity. For articles that looked at all races and ethnicities, there were 32 tests conducted among 20 articles. All but one study had a prim primarily white group of participants, but included other races and ethnicities as well, including some self-identified Native Americans. Impacts from mascots included stereotyping about Native Americans, discrimination in hypothetical evaluations for Native Americans seeking scholarships or jobs, a reported desire to punish Natives in response to mascot removal, dehumanization and violence toward mascot opponents, and a general desensis desensitization or lack of concern about mascots potential harms and impacts. In conclusion, the vast majority of the works that we reviewed and included in our review pointed to the negative impacts of Native American themed mascots on the health and well-being of Native peoples, especially Native youth. This review, we believe, can be a resource to support efforts to re retire harmful Native American mascots at all levels. We are currently seeking publication to reach a broader audience with this literature review, and the review itself is currently submitted for review with an academic journal. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach me at swat at ncai.org. Thank you. Thank you, Sierra. We will be sharing this literature review in our follow-up email to all session attendees, as well as these other resources. First, NCI features on its website the updated overview document for its school mascot tracking database. The link to this document, which lists the current school mascot numbers overall and by mascot nationally, can be found in the chat box and we also will send it to you in our follow-up email. NCAI also regularly shares recent developments through its Ending Indian Mascots email broadcast service. The email addresses of session attendees will be added to this subscription list so that you can get all of the latest news on this topic. And attendees can also access additional related resources on NCAI's Proud to Be webpage found at www.ncai.org forward slash proud to be. So that's www.ncai.org forward slash proud to be. We thank you for joining us today and we hope you find the rest of NCAI's annual convention a rewarding experience.